All right, we are back with Pals TV. We are live from Gallia on site with Brooke. Uh, she's doing another awesome virtual tour for us. And there are two words uh, in the meat industry that you do not say in Southern Ohio, and that's Jimmy Dean, because there's only one sausage producer and one sausage king in Ohio, and that's Bob Evans. And Brooke is at the original Bob Evans farm and uh, showing us where uh, um, the, the original Bob Evans and his wife lived and lots of cool stuff. So can you hear us okay, Brooke? Yes, can you guys hear me? You got you me, can. all right. Okay, yeah. so today we're gonna take you on a tour of Bob Evans. We're at the Homestead is what they call it, the original um, Bob Evans Homestead. Now, this restaurant that I'm gonna pan to is actually not the original, but I have been in the original one. This replaced it just a few years ago. So they tore down the old one and replaced it with this one because today you're gonna learn a lot about it. So some sausage, he had a diner that had 12 stools in it and he wanted to, um, they couldn't get good sausage um, at his diner. So they said, hey, I'm gonna start making my own. So he started processing um, sausage hogs and making his own. And what he ended up doing was um, using feedback from truck drivers who came through this area because it was a heavily trafficked truck driving area. And that's who stopped the most at his diner. And so at those 12 stools, uh, he came up with, hey, I'm gonna try this out and give you some sausage ideas. And they would start buying um, sausage by the tubs and they would take them home to their family. And so he knew then that he was onto something. So his dad wasn't even sure he would make it. So he said, make it into a machine shop so that, you know, at least if this falls through, if this sausage making falls through, if this processing mill falls through, you'll have something else to do. And he did, he did it that way just in case. They were very frugal people. Um, he did it that way in case, but it was a booming success. So there's your mill. And uh, here we've got some other things read you about this. So this is the historical marker here on uh, the Bob Evans homestead. Robert L. Bob Evans, he died in 2007. He was born in 1918. And he actually, um, David, uh, down in Gallia here, almost took his life before that. And I'll tell you that story later. But Bob Evans was born on May 30th, 1918 in Sugar Ridge, Ohio. He married Jewel. Jewel Waters was her name in 1940. And they moved to Gal Bliss. In 1946, Bob took the first step in what would later become Bob Evans Farm Incorporated when he opened a 12-seat diner in Galpolis. Bob, unsatisfied with the quality of the sausage he was able to purchase to serve in his diner, created his own recipe, and before long, Bob Evans was selling his sausage to grocery stores and meat markets all over. Um, <clears throat> how many of you have had Bob Evans sausage? Give me a thumbs up there. From his vision of making quality retail sausage and building a national restaurant chain or saving family farms, Bob Evans was never short on the entrepreneurial spirit needed to make those dreams a reality. And as he watched the company grow to nearly 600 restaurants across the country and from manufacturing sausage himself in 10 pound tubs to dozens of food products in all 50 states, Bob Evans remained the farmer down on the farm. And he was a visionary, but more importantly, Bob Evans was a friend and inspiration to many. His dedication to quality and customers is his legacy to the company that bears his name. You know, we uh, will often joke that Bob Evans, uh, after he died in 2007, there were some changes like to the waitress staff and some of the quality of their products went down. And we would say, man, Bob would not be happy with this. There would, it wouldn't be uncommon for you to walk into the restaurant and actually find Bob himself setting up at the counter and having a coffee and eating a homestyle breakfast. Um, so you would be eating in the same restaurant as Bob Evans. It was a really neat um, experience. I think in the moment you didn't realize what you were doing. So this is his beautiful farm. And I mean, it spans all over. You guys can see out there. It goes on and on for acres and acres. There's a windmill. Um, there's all kinds of land. He has horses, a spring mill, all kinds of things but this was the original homestead so this is where Joel and Bob lived um, here on the farm Bob Evans was very much a uh, family man I'm going to find out I know they had tons of kids so I'm going to read about that too so yeah here's the homestead 
beautiful. It's got these nice pillars in the front. This has become a National Register historical site now as well. So this is a historical site. And here's the marker. The homestead was built in 1820 by Nehemiah Wood. And there's a lot of families um, with the Wood name around here as well, uh, especially with the University of Rio Grande. The homestead was built in 1820 by Nehemiah Wood with an addition completed in 1822 by his son, Harrison. The Wood family, a pioneer family of Gallia County, arrived in 1805. The homestead remained in the Wood family for over 100 years and the two-story federal style building is constructed of bricks made on the site by that freed slaves who accompanied Nehemiah Wood from Virginia. The lane just below the house was a stagecoach route that ran between Chillicothe, you guys know what Chillicothe is, right? And Galpolis. In the mid 1800s, the homestead served as an inn and a stagecoach stop. The Wood family sold their farm to Rye Grand College in 1938, which used the land for college gardening and farming programs. Let's look a little bit more here. Bob and Jewel ended up purchasing the farm in 1953 so their children could grow up in the country. They hosted restaurant owners and grocery meat department managers, showing them that Bob Evans Farm sausage really did come from a farmer down on the farm. With a country kitchen and a beautiful farm landscape, the homestead provided an ideal setting for television commercials, which Bob Evans Farms started producing in the 1950s. The Bob Evans Farm Festival began in 1971, and with a steadily increasing number of visitors, Bob and Jewel built a new house closer to Galpolis. Bob Evans Farm acquired the farm from Bob in 1973, so the company bought it from Bob in 1973 and maintains it as a working farm and local historical center to this day. The homestead was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in December of 1987, right here on the farm. Okay. Okay. So we started from a 12 school diner all the way to having over 600 restaurants. Um, kids, what is your favorite item to order at Bob Evans? Uh, I like the mashed potatoes, chicken tenders, Look, and I like pancakes. their um, piggy pancakes. Yes, piggy and pancakes and bacon. Yes. Um, one of my favorite things is they have a salmon dinner. I really like it. And the wildfire chicken salad is one of my favorites. The farm in Rio Grande, where Bob Evans and his family once lived, like has evolved wine. into a tourist center of types. It has oh, yeah, camping. Okay, what do you like? Sorry. Pancakes and bacon. All right. They have hiking, concerts, and other events throughout the year as well. And of course, the largest event is the Bob Evans Farm Festival. How many of you have been to that? Me. Super awesome. The Bob Evans Farm Festival. And it attracts thousands of visitors and has been doing so since 1971. And it's always held the second full weekend in October. Um, and this is the ground where the farm festival is held. People, you'll see cars all over that field, lined up and campers. Um, they have different bluegrass groups come and play. They pull in bleachers and they'll have ax throwing contests and all kinds of things like that. So it's a lot of fun and a lot of things to buy. They have many vendors and crafts, uh, people who sell things that they have handmade. Okay, so the Evans family opened the sausage shop right in their front yard, which later became the first Bob Evans restaurant, which is still open today that I just showed you. The spirit of hospitality is deeply embedded in the company's history. Today, the homestead serves as a company museum and historical center, which is where we are. The farm also has many beautiful sites for visitors to explore an old cistern where stagecoach travelers watered their horses, an ancient Indian burial mound, a Revolutionary War cemetery where original settlers of this area are uh, buried and several reconstructed historic cabins and a schoolhouse that we're going to show you. The area is rich in history across Raccoon Creek and there's a cave where Daniel Boone reportedly slept. Visitors may also enjoy horseback riding on the grounds in one of their property trails. When I was a little girl in Girl Scouts, I remember we came here and you could do a overnight so you would get on your horse and we would go way up into these woods on a trail way up over top and uh, we would set up a tent and you could camp for the night it was awesome like under the stars tent camping um, right here on these grounds 
Um, Bob and Jewel raised their six children in um, this <laughs> six children. Can you imagine? I've got four. And that's kind of crazy. Two more. Yeah. <laughs> so they raised them in that large brick farmhouse that we showed you known as the homestead. And uh, that was also the stagecoach shop stop and an inn. Uh, when they opened the sausage shop though in their front yard and that became the first restaurant, they also decided to go ahead and build in town so that they could um, host even more people in the area. Let's see here. When they bought this farm in 1953, Bob and a group of about eight family members and friends had been making that sausage already for local grocery stores and meat markets, and they called it Bob Evans Farm Sausage, made by a farmer on the farm. That was kind of their tagline. And before long, the sausage was being delivered by a fleet of 14 trucks to nearly 1,800 locations. Bob's television ads invited people to come down and visit us at the farm. And before long, so many people came that it was hard for Bob and Jewel to accommodate them. The restaurant that had 12 seats, now the company had built a restaurant on the farm with four stools and six tables <laughs> to better serve them. The sausage shop, which is now the restaurant, was the company's first venture into the restaurant business. Visitors could come and sample the sausage, and uh, try out different products and even do farm tours at that time. Uh, once again, the shop where, or the homestead was right next door where they raised their kids, so it was easy access as well. So once they had that increasing, um, you know, just stream of visitors and it became very busy, they decided to go ahead and move into town and uh, they had that all-American farming community down on the farm. And at the restaurant, you could experience traditions of all-American farming community. So they had hay and sorghum, corn and wheat were grown on the farm, which is also home to many horses. So actually, sorghum, speaking of that, this is a sorghum mill. It was constructed in the mid-1800s, and this mill still operates every fall during the Bob Evans Farm Festival. Help him, please. In the car? get him to be quiet um the second weekend of october so they make sorghum syrup here that you can actually buy during the festival it's a hundred percent pure and it's a uh, four dollars one pound bottle I can buy so you one. can see here what is sorghum cane well it is a patent officer introduced this sweet sorghum in 1853. it's a native of africa and a drought resistant heat tolerant member of the grass family Sweet sorghum is grown for its stalk and growing in the field, you might say it looks like corn. So it kind of has a corn look to it with a thick stalk. Sorghum grows six to 12 feet tall and is one to two inches in diameter at the base of the stalk. I don't know if you can see some of those pictures there. So what is made from sorghum cane? Well, sweet sorghum is grown extensively for syrup production in the southeastern states. Kentucky is one of eight states in Southeast and Midwest producing about 90% of the total U.S. output. It's made from the juice of sorghum cane. In years past, it was an important source of sweetener, especially when white sugar was expensive or difficult to find. So very resourceful. See how dark it is? Let's see if I can zoom in. I don't know if I can. I don't think you can zoom in. Okay, so right here. Um, the process of making sorghum starts in early spring when the sorghum seeds are planted. The cane must be harvested after it matures 90 to 120 days and before the first frost. Labor intensive harvesting includes topping and breaking off the seed heads and then stripping the leaves off and cutting the stalks. The cane is then hand fed into the mill and you can see the horses here churning that. The rollers in the mill crush the stalks which squeeze the juice out of the cane and the juice is then collected into a cane container to await cooking. The juice is cooked in an evaporator pan over a wood fire. Sorghum syrup can be used as a replacement for honey, molasses, that's kind of what it tastes like if you guys have ever had molasses, and sugar in many recipes. You can put it in breads, cookies, cakes, candies, pies, baked beans, glazes, sauces, uh, fresh hot sorghum syrup is a treat over ice bacon. cream if you want to put it on your ice cream with or bacon. like uh, with bacon. biscuits. Bacon. Mm, bacon. Sounds good. Fried bacon. Bacon. Good. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, sorghum contains such hard to find nutrients oh. as iron. It has calcium, potassium, 
Before the invention of daily vitamins, many doctors would prescribe sorghum as a daily supplement for those low in nutrients. Today, sorghum syrup is considered a very high antioxidant food. So this is something that we might want to look into. Are molasses and sorghum the same? No, molasses is not made from sorghum cane, but is the byproduct of the sugar industry. Molasses is used primarily in animal feed products and fermentation industry. I think that's pretty neat. So, Reagan, let him in the car, please. Okay, so here you can see some of the stuff they use during the festival. Uh, ways that they stock the, corn, the sorghum plants. And up here is actually where you, um, I'm going to try to get up there and not fall down. Uh, you can see where a um, horses would be put onto these as they would grind into the mill. So the horses would be on those big wood uh, spots there, post, and they would go around and around and around. You can see here. So very original right here. And some of these are the ways that you get up into the woods here behind Bob Evans Farm, the trails that we're talking about. Um, so next, I'm going to show you Adamsville. Adamsville is a village. Um, it is a farm log cabin village. The history of the farm in Southeast Ohio is reflected in the farm's log cabin village, Adamsville, originally settled in the early 1800s. It is today the site of four authentic log cabins and a log schoolhouse that have been reconstructed on the site at Bob Evans Farm. We're gonna go down and look at these. All right, Rylan, let's hope we don't fall down <laughs> this hill. So what are your all's favorite things from Bob Evans? Have, if you've been to Bob Evans to eat, um, maybe Jonah can unmute you and you can tell me something that you've loved to eat there, your favorite meal. If you have, if you have a favorite meal, raise your hand so we can unmute you. Let me see if I can do it. I know you're unmuted. Okay, who wants to be unmuted? Let's see. Alex. Uh, let me see if I can do it here. Okay, Alex can unmute. CJ can unmute. Uh, you doing Bob Evans tour, huh? Yes, Alex. Do you, do you have a favorite Bob Evans food? Um, I like their waffles. Waffles, awesome. Uh, okay. Yeah, um, and pancakes. And pancakes. So you're a breakfast eater. Yep. You like the breakfast food. gravy. Uh, yep. Okay, so sausage and gravy, Caitlin. Yeah. All right, man. And I made quesadillas, I made um, my quesadillas, I made chiladas yesterday, homemade, homemade chiladas. Oh, good. I, did I put you in the mood for some enchiladas? <laughs> good. All right, Dusty, do you have a favorite at Bob Evans? Yeah, I told you, raspberry crepes. Oh, they're crepes. Okay, you like the crepes. Yeah, That's stay awesome. away from those. Yep, you can't have too many of those, can you, with your sugar? That's okay. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, before we move on to Adamsville, I'll say some of my favorite things um, to eat at Bob Evans are their omelets. And so you can customize your omelet any way you want. So you're going to have, um, they do have like a Western omelet that I really like, but I really enjoy getting their sausage, of course, um, their hash browns inside of this egg omelet with cheese. It is super good. Sometimes I add a little spinach just so I feel better about myself, right? Get some healthy in there. Um, I love their coffee, actually. They sell coffee, too. And who doesn't love their banana bread? They have homemade banana, I bread. Love banana bread. Oh, yeah, it's really good. All right, so that was a little tour of um, Bob Evans Farm. Over here, you can even see the windmill. See that? It's beautiful. Actually, people will fly planes here, so that's kind of cool, too. Some plane action goes on here. All right, so now we're moving on to Adamsville, which is still a part of Bob Evans farm. Welcome to Adamsville Log Cabin Village. The village of Adamsville was first settled along Raccoon Creek in 1800 when Adam Rickenbaugh, a Revolutionary War veteran, brought his family from Virginia to the valley that he had seen while in service. So he was up here in the Revolutionary War and then he has seen how beautiful this land is and he decides he wants to move here. 
So he applied to the federal government for this land with a bounty that he received from the war. Well, the deed is signed by Thomas Jefferson, President James Madison, Secretary of State. So yeah, he got all this and the deed's actually signed by the President Thomas Jefferson and the Secretary of State at the time, James Madison. Adam built a grist mill on the creek and it became the meeting place for um, families and community. Soon there were two grocery stores, a meat market, um, two blacksmith shops and a livery in the village. The village was plotted by Adam's sons, Adam Jr. and William, and in 1805, Nehemiah Wood bought the grist mill from Adam Rickenbaugh and later added a um, fueling mill, the cleansing of cloth, particularly wool, to eliminate oils, dirts, and other impurities, and a sawmill. Due to flooding, the villagers began to move to higher ground when the Rio Grande College was founded in 1876. Beginning in 1971 and continuing over the next 15 years, the Adamsville Log Cabin Village was recreated in its original location along the Raccoon Creek at the Bob Evans Farms. In consideration of flooding and ravages of the time, the village was moved to its present day spot you see right here. This dismantling and renovation project took place during 2011 and 2012. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about Rio Grande, right? When you hear that word, it's actually spelled Rio Grande. And many people will say, why does everyone pronounce it Rio Grande? Rio Grande, Ohio, Rio Grande College, University of Rio Grande. Well, I'm going to tell you how Rio Grande got its name. As the village of Adamsville grew, the settlers applied for a post office. So the U.S. government informed them there was already a town by the name of Adamsville in Muskingum County, Ohio. So they, in order to receive a post office, they were going to have to choose a different name. And they're like, oh man. So from 1846 to 48, the war with Mexico was ongoing and stories of fighting on the Rio Grande River headlined in the newspaper that was delivered to the mill here. Sylvester Wood, son of Nehemiah Wood, read that paper and said, I'll bet no one would have a Rio Grand Post Office. And even though the villagers mispronounced the word, it became the name of their post office. The Rio Grande Post Office was established in the village of Adamsville on August 10th of 1846. So there you have it. If you've ever wondered why do we mispronounce Rio Grande here and we call it Rio Grande, that's it. It all goes back to this son of Nehemiah Wood, Sylvester Wood. He came up with that. And it was because it was popular in the paper at the time. They had gotten this paper. They were seeing stories of a war going on in Mexico and uh, at the Rio Grande River. And so they said, Rio Grande it is. So that's how we got the name. Um, let me turn this around again. This is the Adazil village then and now. So there are pictures here of what it used to be and then how they were moving it and where it became established in this picture now, but you're gonna see it in real life. Now, during a regular time of the year without a pandemic, you're allowed to actually go into these log cabins today. Obviously with the pandemic, they have um, said you cannot, go, you can no longer go inside of them right now. Probably they don't wanna to have to, um, probably they don't wanna to have to keep up with cleaning after people have been in them, which is understandable, so. Uh, we're going to take you on a little tour of these cabins here of the Adamsville Village. So it's been recreated. Just interesting to think of the 1800s and how much work went into these. As I'm considering my kids going back to school, I think of the one room schoolhouse and how they made it back then in just one room with grades all together. Um, these were families that lived together, they did life together, and then they also schooled their children together. So the first place we're coming to here is the log cabin schoolhouse. It was called the Ingalls Schoolhouse, which at first I was like, is this little house on the prairie? But it's not. The Ingalls Schoolhouse, this two-story log cabin was uh, with rough V notching. It's probably one of the largest original log structures of its kind. It was built near Lowell, Ohio in 1860 and served as a schoolhouse until 1918. The upstairs would have been used for the teacher's living quarters. So the teacher would have lived here. They would have lived upstairs. And in later years, the cabin was used as a general store, also a residence, and then finally a barn. In 1986, Wayne Ingalls donated the logs to the farm and the cabin became part of the reconstructed Adamsville. So this is a memorial schoolhouse. And I can show you a little bit inside. This would be your desk. You guys can see how they're recreated. And then there's also some things around the room. 
a water pail. You wouldn't go outside. To, they would have water for the day inside. They would also cook their lunch in there. There's like a cast iron skillets. Um, there is a chalkboard. Uh, there's, there's Bibles. They would learn the scriptures. And then they would do, yes, like their, Amer Rylan says there's an American flag. So they would also, uh, see, there's the chalkboard. They're learning their ABCs. There's the uh, thing Rylan was talking about, the American flag. So yeah, meet uh, the schoolhouse. Okay, let's move along here. This is uh, kind of neat, the Underground Railroad um, facts that go on with this area. Freedom Seekers, Ohio and the Underground Railroad. This is one of the cabins. Can you see inside there? Yes. That was built, um, that actually helped 100 freed slaves who came to the farm with Nehemiah Wood and his family in 1805. It's noted that Uncle Albert Hurst first lived in the cabin near a sweet spring on Granny's Branch Fork. At one time, a man named Thompson raised nine girls in this home. Rio Grande College students often lived in this house. The last actually lived here in 1952. Two of the cabin's doors led to lean-to rooms, and one of which was usually the kitchen. So you can see here uh, a bed on this side of the property. There's also a, a fireplace in the middle. The way they decorated the night lights, um, the water pails where they would wash for the evening. So yeah, beautiful. Let's see if we can get in here on this side. Show you one more side here. There's the fireplace I was telling you about where they would do their cooking and heat as well. A lot of history about slavery and the abolitionists fleeing, all of those things, code signals and signs that you would find in underground railroad type. Um, conversations I'm trying to get to my there is also a tobacco barn on this property so pretty cool uh, Riley can you hold these for me mm -hmm. put them underneath here is fine do you guys find log cabins to be interesting I think they're really cool to think about the history there's also some blacksmith shops I don't know if we're going to see that but Next up is the Appalachian crafts. So there's a lot of looming and uh, rug making, those sort of things. This is an Appalachian craft uh, cabin on the land in 1880, James Sprague built his, this cabin on land that he owned in the township of Springfield, about six miles from here. This cabin was constructed using pine, poplar, and oak, which grew in the Sprague property. The notching is dovetailed. So that means like how it's put together. The property remained in this family for four generations, and in the early 1980s, Bob Evans purchased the Sprague property, and he donated the cabin to the farm in 1992, and then it became part of the Evansville Village. I'm going to try to show you inside here. So you see that loom back here, um, a spinner's we uh, wheel that you could see as well. There's a rug that was made as well from that. Um, over here is a loom and some more crafts that were made. These are the kind of things also that you'll find at the Bob Evans Farm Festival. They'll be looming. They'll be doing these very things and crafts of that time period. And then you can also buy things from them. Quilting. There's a quilt back there. Um, some other things. Some materials. Okay. So that was the arts and crafts cabin. What, buddy? Did you turn the alarm on? I heard that. It's okay. All right, this is the Phillips Pioneer Home. In 1850, 28 year old Abraham Phillips built this two story log cabin near the town of Kerr. I know where Kerr is. It's about five miles from here. The cabin has the half dovetail corner notches. The upper logs are pine, the lower logs are oak, and other hardwoods. Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Isaacs owned the cabin in 1970s and sold it to Bob Evans, who also donated it to the farm. In 1974 to 75, this cabin became the first log cabin reconstructed at the previous location of the Adamsville Village near Raccoon Creek. Let's take a look inside, see what we can find. So here's a table and it has a sample of their food on it. Um, there's a bread basket. Over here on the floor, you can see a little play area for children. 
I've got some, a teddy bear that would have been made and constructed together. You've also got your fire um, place that has the cast iron skillets and um, a gridiron for you to eat um, and cook. Above the fireplace on the mantle is actually their gun, so a way that they would know where that was in case there was an attack. Let's see if they can see anything else in the other windows. Let's go over here. These even have really nice porches. I don't know if you've seen that on them. So here's the bed. Uh, we can get close there. Yep, there's the bed. There's a baby cradle right beside of it. Um, you're going to see things just hanging around that they would play with. Um, there's even some uh, seating toys that would have been hand carved. Uh, very few shoes because, right, they, they would use a shoe forever and they would even pass that on. There you go. So this is the last one in the log cabin village. This is called the Adamsville Mercantile. Sometime between 1800 and 1830, the Stormont family built this cabin near Johns Creek, about 14 miles from the farm. The notching is half dovetail and of note, are the original second floor joist and the bowed beam above the door. Samuel um, Stormont owned this cabin as late as 1874. Adam Heinemann was the next owner, and then Bob Evans bought it in 1971 and moved it here. Um, the mercantile in early country stores were known as general stores. So this is a, a general store, mercantiles or an emporium. These establishments provided one-stop shopping. I don't know if we can get in there. Uh, one-stop shopping to small towns, villages, and farmers. The Adamsville Mercantile is filled with supplies, equipment, and tools. The cabin history is between 1800, of course, and uh, 1830 when that Stormont family built it. Uh, the next owner, of course, and then Bob Evans. Let's see if we can see in there a little better. Um, supplies, you see sacks there that could have been their mill or... Uh, grits, oats, whatever. There's also fresh vegetables, but beyond food, there was also anything you would need um, in your village, whether it be tools or um, maybe you were looking for medicines. Those sort of things were all found here. So you would, it would be a one-stop shop. Don't you guys wish we had more one-stop shopping? <laughs> I guess we kind of do now. I guess it's called Walmart, but <laughs> over here you see a display shelf that has, um, there we go actually has some of the things I'm talking about, like grinders or drills. I see an ax and um, there's diggers. There is even a ladder in here for sale. So it's a one-stop shop. And then down in, down in the casing there, you would see dishes or uh, dolls, some of the more um, sought after items that the ladies would like. So that's in that part of the cabin. You know, when I think about the entrepreneurial um, spirit of Bob Evans, I, I don't know that he ever thought that this is what would have happened here on this homestead or that he would be a place where people would come to film commercials or that he would have a place that people would come camp or that he would fill this place with thousands and thousands of people every year in the second weekend of October and continue teaching them about um, history and what was used to um, power their life at that time. You can see this is Route 35 um, here in front of us, and it's a heavily trafficked area. Now they've actually built a US 35, so this has now become a secondary road, but still very busy. This isn't even half of it. On down is where you'll see the cat. This is where they keep horses even now to this day. Um, donkeys, all their animals, chickens, uh, some of their farming land you can see way off in the distance. So this is a, a huge property that started out with a little dream, actually out of necessity. Um, Bob Evans saw, hey, people are not being provided with the best sausage, and I think I can do it. So he saw a need, and he worked hard to meet that need. He loved people along the way and made them feel just like family. And then he made sure that people understood that farmers and farms are what keep things going. We want to preserve history. Um, so I just think like what an amazing thing that he lived till 2007. And I told you guys I would tell you a little bit about how David almost killed Bob Evans. But um, the Raccoon Creek, which is mentioned several times here, 
down at the very end of these farms uh, that I was just pointing out to you is where you can get onto the road. And uh, Bob actually was pulling out in his truck and he pulled out and didn't notice David like peeling through here because it's a 55 and he was definitely going to get out onto the road. And so David's like, Brooke, I almost killed Bob Evans today. Could have been him in the news. But anyway, he lived a few more, a few more days after that, a few more years. I don't know. <laughs> So yeah, you guys have any questions about the Bob Evans farm or Adamsville or being out here and, and the history? Are there any things that you wish that you could, um, that, that was like that, you know, like I, do I wish that I knew how to quilt? Can you hold that for me, Bob? Do you wish that you could try sorghum? Do you wish you could go on a trail ride? I mean, what are some of the things that here really amazed you guys? Let's see. I see Nick maybe wants to talk. How old is Bob? How old is he? Is, is um, Bob, I don't think Bob's still alive, is he? No, he died in 2007. 2007. Oh, how old was he, Nick? Is that oh, what you're asking? Yeah. yeah. Oh, he's pretty old. I can't remember when it said he was born. Um, in the 40s, maybe? I, I don't know. Uh, I have to go back and look. I, I think I can help you out. Can you help me out? How old was Bob Evans when he passed away? This is an important question. It is, especially for the the. Um, he was uh, about. Eighty nine, I think it said. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Eighty nine. Yeah, I thought he was close to ninety. So that's yeah. Yep. Wow. And I, honestly, like you would walk into Bob Evans here, like just like you would go into a restaurant and he would be sitting at the, the bar. They had like bar stools here still. I don't know if all, um, all Bob Evans have those, but we would have a bar where the waitress would come up and greet you and feed you at the bar. And he would be there a lot, a, often, like you would find him there eat, drinking his coffee. <laughs> that is cool. Um, does anybody ha else have a, a question for Brooke or? Dusty, go ahead. When did trail rides begin? Ooh, well, I think like it became more of whenever they started having a lot of visitors to the farm. You know, it wasn't meant to be this, but as time grew, people came, he invited them. It was like, come find, come see a farm. This is where we, real life happens. Like farming is what supplies restaurants. Farming is what makes this go. And so he said, hey, why don't you guys come down? So he started having people visit and they would stay in the inn or the homestead I showed you. And then it became like, okay, well, while they're here, what can we do? Well, let's show them more of the farm. So then trail riding became a part of that. Very cool. Thank you for answering my question. Yeah, that, that sure would be cool, Brooke, to be able to have a, uh, a, a place where you live where people want to come do trail riding on your, your uh, right. wouldn't it? Yes. Uh, yeah, Aaron and his family came down to the Bob Evans Farm Festival, um, and we all came out and hung out here together. That was something that was going on that weekend that they visited. So that was really fun. I mean, they got to see some of that as well. And um, just, it's a huge deal. It's a very big deal. Is. Caitlin, do you have a question? Oh, uh, Bob Bell is Bob, my place. Hannah. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Um, another thing is our, our uh, Gallia County pals, um, they do come to the farm festival. So um, they have animal booths set up and they'll go visit the animals. They'll get to go to all the craft um, vendors. Uh, they just spend the day here. So yeah, they actually visit. Your, your co-pal friends are visiting the farm. That is that is pretty cool. Uh, so so Brooke, what was uh, uh, what's the the old time skill that you wish that you had? Oh man, I think I just love the you know we've stopped having a um, a garden and um, getting providing your own food and stuff. I mean we do have chickens, but. I just think it's neat to think they made it like they, they were survivalists. They were realists. And to them, it wasn't like a big deal. Like, Ooh, I'm, I'm making my own food. Cause I have to it, it was just a natural, like, this is what we do. 
So I think we've lost some of that. Obviously, like we've become really convenience type people instead of working hard and waiting on something and watching it grow and then harvesting it. So even when we were talking about the sorghum, um, you know, it didn't just turn into something they did because the white sugar was getting so expensive. So they came up with an alternative that was cheaper, they could afford, but in the end, it also had nutri like nutrients that they were needing. It, they were low in iron or magnesium. It was prescribed by doctors then. So out of a place that you need something, um, they came up with an alternative, but then in turn became something that was useful um, to our bodies for us to survive. It was becoming something that was prescribed by doctors. So are there things we're missing today that uh, because we just kind of become lazier um, that we're not finding maybe oh, cures for or um, alternatives for that would really be helpful. So, yeah, I don't know. Just like living off the land. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. I think that uh, it was, everyone talks about the simple life and, and simpler, but I think, um, I think the big point is that they, they really just had it, one, um, one thing that they were up against and that was really mm -hmm. just, just uh, feeding and sheltering themselves, you know, and, right. uh, everything out. And like you said, it was just uh, survival off the land. And, mm -hmm. and um, I think uh, uh, what I always thought was really cool about a lot of those, those uh, folks that were uh, on the farm and, and live off mm -hmm. the land and the ingenuity that they would come right. up with. Um, that was the they were yeah. just the, the, the simple solutions and creative ideas that I've seen from uh, people that, that have lived off the land or um, right. lived in a kind of an obsolete uh, area where they didn't have, you know, Walmart to, to run up to. Right. Um, it's it's just always really kind of cool and it kind of makes you want to go out and, and create something solve a problem and, and mm -hmm. uh, do that and so. I just think of like the tight-knit community thing I think we've lost that a lot you know like this whole the village would take care of each other um, you know now we have churches or people will drive like 30 minutes to go to a church well back then you went to church on your road you know right. like it was called you know sterling church because your road was sterling road <laughs> Right. So they lived and did life together. And when someone had a baby, they took care of them. And when you needed to go do this or that, they stepped in. Or if there was an attack on your farm, all the guys got together. So I think there's that community building that, that I miss now. I think we become really like segregated yeah. instead of together. Uh, yeah. I, I totally agree. I think that's a, a good take on, uh, it's, it's nice to see, um, you know, something like, like what Brooke just showed us and just to kind of see some of the, uh, um, just, just the cool ways that people, uh, live and used to live, you know, it used to be a bigger part of our, of our nation, you know, of, of living that way. And now it seems like it's a, a very small, um, part, you know, in a, a minority group that, that actually still continues to live that way. Uh, but, but, uh, like Brooke and I said, I, I, I have a ton of respect for it, that lifestyle and uh, the simplicity and just being able to, to overcome a lot of those, uh, those obstacles. So thank you, Brooke, for the awesome tour. It's very cool to, to uh, uh, you know, reiterate that uh, I think some people might, might not have even known that Bob Evans was, because um, he's such a national treasure now and uh national brands that his company has become that maybe uh some people forget that he was uh born and and got started right here in southern ohio so another uh awesome uh big win for ohio so that's all the content we have for uh this segment we'll be back at the top of the hour feel free to uh hang out and socialize until then and uh we'll be back so stick with us <laughs> 